Okay, so you can see the rest of 15.1 is just a ton of examples. Uh, last time we saw something like this was in Thermo. Uh, we finished off the Thermo unit with example after example after example, just because of the large variety of ways that we could present this similar information. This is really just stoichiometry and layers of it for your ice table, and then two interpretations of K and percent reaction. Hopefully they correlate. So I've got about six examples left here. I'm going to do four of them for you. I'm going to leave a couple of them to you guys just so that this only gets uh, takes about two more videos to get through. All right, so for 3C, all right, there's the completed ice table. You can try that. Calculate K, you should get 0 0.30, therefore it's reactant favored. And then 30% percent reaction or percent yield for a reactant favored, and so they correlate again. Um, Question number four is a good one to look at. Number four has some different stuff going on with it. It's again just a different presentation of the same thing and allows us to use this K value a little bit differently. Uh, at the given temperature, KC for a following reaction, you can see that you have that hydrogen iodide equilibrium again. This time I've given you a vessel of hydrogen iodide first and then looked at the equation and you get a K value of less than one. This means that it should be a reactant favored equilibrium. You should have mostly hydrogen iodide when this is all left over. You've been given the equilibrium concentrations of hydrogen and, hydrogen and iodine at two to the negative four moles per liter. So very small amounts of these are found at equilibrium. And it says find HI. Ah, well this is a little bit different. All right, usually we complete an ice table to find this, but I have no initial concentrations. So how do we solve this one? All right, so take a look at what information has been provided to us. So for this one, there's your balanced equation. There's your K value showing it's reactant favored. We have no information to figure out the initial and the changes here. So we ignore that and we just have our equilibrium. But we have two of them, we're looking for a third. Well, remember what happens with the K value expression. If we take a look at the formula for KC, it is the concentrations of hydrogen, iodine, all over the concentration of hydrogen iodide raised to the power of two. You have the K value this time, so it's given you K. This is the first time this has happened to us. We can actually use that because if you look at it, you have three of four things and you're just now trying to find out hydrogen iodide. So remember, this is an equality. This is an equation you can rearrange and solve. Multiply both sides by concentration of hydrogen iodide squared, divide both sides by Kc, and you get this. Oops. In which you know all of these things. If you want to just solve for the concentration of hydrogen iodide, then take the square root of all of this. Okay. So now we just have to put in our numbers and hopefully it goes through our calculator uh, the right way and we can get to an answer. So the concentration of hydrogen iodide based upon the authenticity of this is the root of concentration of hydrogen 2.00 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter times iodine which is the same so I'm just going to square this saves me a little bit of work and I'm putting this over KC of 0 0.0140. And then I'm going to square root all of this. If you do that in your calculator correctly, you will end up with a fairly small number, but larger than your product concentrations of 1.69 times 10 to the negative 3 moles per liter. Okay, so question number four is a good one to look at because we are able to use the Kc value when provided to figure out other equilibrium concentrations. It's a formula like any other formula, so it can be rearranged and solved for. So there's some new variety for some of our questions. All right, let's go on to question number six. Question number six is gonna take another little leap. All right, um, this is one that uh, you'll probably see one question like on the quiz. We're not going to crush you guys with it, but it is an important concept, especially when we consider balanced equations. Here we have a reaction between copper oxide, copper one oxide, or pardon me, copper two oxide, carbon monoxide, 
and an equilibrium with copper solid and carbon dioxide, and you can see again a reactant-favored equilibrium expression. Very, very hot. What equilibrium concentrations of the gases uh, will be? Will you have of the gases if you have 0.5 moles of carbon dioxide placed in a 500 ml flask? There's that nasty little diploma exam thing again, and you have excess solid of copper oxide. So, all right. You have only one initial constant, uh, initial concentration, and you're trying to find out the re remaining parts of the equilibrium concentrations to do, uh, and solve the rest of the problem. So, what do we have? We go back to our notes, and this is what it would look like on a piece of paper once you balance the equation, and you put in all of your various parts. Remember, we put 0.5 moles into a 0.5 liter container or a 500 ml container. So that would work out to a 1.0 mole per liter concentration. There's the first little wrinkle. We have nothing given here. We have just uh, carbon, carbon dioxide. That should be zero. The reaction hasn't run yet in our initial state. We haven't allowed them to mix. We have a K value that we're going to use. So how can we solve this one? Well, a couple things should appear right away. Copper 2 oxide is a solid. That is a condensed state. It doesn't change, so it is ignored in your ice table and equilibrium concentrations. Same thing for solid copper. So our equilibrium expression here is fairly uh, simplified. We're also lacking any equilibrium information. Remember, we had some to be able to use the equilibrium law. This one has none. What the heck are we going to do? Well. Think about this logically. What should happen to the amount of carbon monoxide as the reaction progresses? Should it increase or should it decrease? Bonus points to use that said, it will decrease. We just don't know by how much. So we have an unknown here. But regardless of how we look at this, the equilibrium concentration will be 1 minus this unknown value. It can't all disappear, otherwise it would be quantitative. Look at the mole ratio. The mole ratio through this balanced equation is 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, which means if this decreases by x because of a 1 to 1 mole ratio, then this should increase by x. And now we have something that we can use. Yeah, I know... Rational expressions, not our favorite part of math. This would, in university, require the quadratic equation. Now, interestingly enough, in Physics 30 and Chem 30, the quadratic equation appears all over the course. But Alberta Sciences say, we cannot teach you the quadratic equation. So we have to find some sort of shortcut here. Let's take a look at the equilibrium law and see if a shortcut appears to us for this particular problem. All right, we have our K value. We take a look at what's involved in it. The product of CO2, concentration raised to the power of one, all over carbon monoxide raised again to the power of one. So we have our concentrations. Let's put in our numbers and letters, sorry guys, and see what happens. 0 0.520 0 becomes equal to X over 1 minus x. Okay, so we have a rational expression here. We should probably get all the x's on the same side of the equation. All right, to do that then, I should probably start moving things around and do some distributive properties here and see what I can get. Because right now, while they're on the same side, it's going to be hard to put them together if they're both numerator and denominator. So, going to multiply by 1 minus x and do the same thing to this side over here. That gives me 0 0.520 times 1 minus x is equal to x. All right, now we have a way that we can get x's all on the same side of the expression. To do this, though, we need our distributive property. Multiply 0.52 through your expression here. And so we end up with 0 0.520. <coughs> minus 
0.520x is equal to x. Now it's just an addition statement, or subtraction statement. I add 0.520x to both sides. That's a 2. That would cancel. Let's rewrite it up here because we're starting to take up a lot of space. And so now I have 0 0.520 is equal to 1.520x. All right, remember x is just 1x plus 0.52x gives us this total. Divide by 1.52. Since the two numbers are being multiplied, x is now by itself, and we have this value here. So x works out to a value of 0 0.342. Now this is, of course, not the answer. Be very careful. This is just the value for the change. This is what we got with this one. So this now has to be applied back here and here. And so 1 minus 0.342 would be 0 0.658. And this, of course, is just x, 0 0.342. You have now found the equilibrium concentrations. Yeah, 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 I know. So this is where some of the math rears its ugly head in this particular unit. If you don't have an equilibrium concentration or a change available, we have to solve for an unknown. This one avoids the quadratic because of the single 1x issues as we get into other things in which we have different molar coefficients and therefore different squares and powers. We must use the quadratic equation. I will show you another shortcut to avoid that. Um, I know there's one to two questions on the quiz that will deal with this issue because it is a very important one going forward in which you pay very close attention to your equilibrium law versus your balanced equation. Okay, so try and keep things organized, work in columns, and just keep rewriting. Yes, these have a lot of writing with them. They're a little bit tedious, but they are immensely achievable. Two more examples coming your way in the last video for 15.1. I will leave the others to you. You can see in your notes that answers are given for the other questions that we have skipped so far.